Hello, uh, thank you for joining me. Uh, my name is Matt Smith. I'm a visual artist uh, based in County Kilkenny uh, in Ireland. I'm delighted to have been asked to give a talk for Outing the Past as part of Collins Barracks uh, presentations during the festival. Over the last 12 or 13 years, I've worked with a number of museums as a visual artist to try and explore how LGBT people and lives can better be represented or addressed and how museums, for want of a better word, can be queered. So today um, I'm going to talk to you uh, with huge thanks to Susan Sontag about notes on queering, how to queer as a verb. I think one of the things we first need to address is that museums are not neutral and museums work in very complicated ways to uh, tell overarching histories. And in order to do that, some lives get talked about more than others. Museums are particularly uh, adept at removing personal histories, emotion and effect from objects so that objects come into the museum system and are divorced from the people who loved them or cared for them. This is an example, I think, that points uh, this out quite well. It's a chair that was auctioned at Christie's in 1989. It was listed as an oak reclining armchair by L and JG Stickley, circa 1920. Unless the catalogue from the Christie's sale and the chair are kept together, there's no way of knowing that this chair was sold as part of the Robert Mapplethorpe collection. The chair was one of a large number of objects that furnished the photographer Mapplethorpe's home and which were used within his photographs. In fact, if you look at this edited image of Mapplethorpe's photograph of Helmut and Brooks from 1978, and look past the image of one man being fisted by another, you can see the same stickly chair, albeit with the original leather pad. This chair, once at the core of queer aesthetic and queer visual life, both as part of a queer collection and also the part subject of a queer artwork, illustrates that heteronormalization, which can happen when queered objects are disassociated from their queer context, and become, yet again, another oak armchair. So what can we do? How, how does this uh, affect how we work with museums and how museums should work if they want to uh, make sure connections with queer people exist and are brought to life? Jack Halberstam has talked about gay and lesbian history as a repressed archive and the historian as an intrepid archeologist, digging through homophobic erasure to find the truth. And I think um, this can either be seen in one of two ways, either this is difficult work or this is playful work that has huge joy in it and just involves a bit of time and, and effort to find queer lives and queer narratives. In 2010, I was invited by Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery to work with them to review their museum through a queer lens. The resulting show, Queer in the Museum, uh, took place throughout the museum in, in a number of different galleries. I was excited to work with Birmingham because I'd been an undergraduate there and I remember in the early 1990s coming across this label within the museum. It links the Victorian painter Simeon Solomon, uh, his sexuality uh, with, with his painting style. That it leads to, and links Simeon's eventual uh, death within a London workhouse to his homosexuality in the early 90s didn't seem that, that big a deal to me. It was just exciting to find one label within a huge museum that was uh, willing to talk about LGBT lives. So when I went back to work with the museum again, I knew there was at least one object that was made by an LGBT artist. And I thought the best place to start is to 
audit their collections management database to go into the museum records and pull up all the objects that had an LGBTQ association. The key terms lesbian, gay, bisexual and trans brought up no objects whatsoever. Fortunately, when I put queer in as a search term, an object came up and it was this object. It's a photograph of the work of Edward Byrne Jones. It's a portrait of Miss Dorothy Drew and is most emphatically alive, almost alarmingly so. It has a queer kind of elfin charm. This wasn't the queerness I was looking for and raised a lot of questions about why the museum was not labeling or cataloging their objects with LGBTQ, LGBTQ associations. So I decided that if the museum wasn't going to signpost where the queer objects were, then maybe this was some of the work I was going to have to do as part of the project. This sculpture by Epstein is at the start of the museum. I've walked past it dozens of times and never really read it as anything other than a sculpture by Epstein. The curator kindly explained that it had been sculpted with the face of a woman and the body of a man. So in some ways, this could be seen as a trans figure. What was interesting to me is as a visitor, I was so used to heteronormalizing the museum and its collections that I would never have read this as a trans figure. Therefore, I felt this needed signposting and used the motif of a green carnation, the sign that gay men in Victorian London would use to signify same-sex desire and placed a green carnation or its symbol next to every object I could find that had a queer association. In this case, making a large cape of green carnations. Elsewhere, I worked as curator's work, bringing objects together to tell stories. Here I placed a Victorian taxidermy otter with three salt glazed uh, ceramic bears. If you're on the gay scene and you know that a bear is a large hairy gay man and an otter is a thinner hairy gay man, you realize that this just becomes a fairy gay disco. This is ridiculous. These objects aren't meant to be together, but when they do, they start to tell a narrative that one I find hilarious and enjoy hugely, but also I think holds a mirror up to how curators quite often put objects together to tell narratives that were never originally part of, of, of the intention of the maker or the owner of the objects. Elsewhere in the museum, when I came across pairings of sculptures, they were usually in male female couples. And each time I tried to remove one of the figures to queer that coupling. So originally there was a sculpture of Eve and Cupid on the left of this image, and I replaced it with a sculpture of Ulysses bending the bow. So thereby querying the pairing of the two sculptures. I think it's important to reflect how often we heteronormalize pairings and whether this was the intention of an artist or had any relevance to the objects at all, it's the default position that I think we quite all too often naturally fall into. And elsewhere, I made new ceramic figurines uh, for playful interventions within the gallery. Here, by placing a new figurine of a man with a green carnation and a red hanky in his back pocket, turns the parian figure on the right from a farm boy into a cruising youth. And uh, it was this sense of playfulness and naughtiness that, that I really wanted to work with. Queering doesn't need to be serious. It can be, but it can also be great fun. In 2015 and 16, I was invited to be artist in residence at the Victorian Albert Museum. The museum provides the artists with a workspace within the museum and the possibility to uh, work with the collections and uh, curate them slightly in a number of the cases. I was particularly interested in why historical uh, ceramic figurines of men displayed characteristics that we'd more usually associate with um, gay men from the 1970s. And I wanted to try and unpick this and explore this and see what it might tell us. 
So the first case display I did involved uh, taking ceramic figurines from different countries and placing them on a binary. On the left were the most manly, traditionally manly or butch figures, and on the right were the least manly or campus figures. I have a really love-hate relationship with figurines. There's a lot of love in there, but I'm drawn back to how camp most of them seem. And it certainly felt, seemed a lot easier to fill the right-hand side of this case than the left. But these are historical representations of masculinity. And somehow I wanted to see if contemporary ideas of masculinity would overlay onto this. So I decided to use a contemporary barometer of camp the Eurovision Song Contest, as a means to assess the historical canvas of these objects. I specifically correlated the historical success of three different countries Eurovision wins with their potential to produce camp ceramic figurines as evidenced in the museum collections. The correlation was scientifically undoubtable and uh, it's clear, I think, for all to see that the camper uh, country's figurines were the better they've done at the Eurovision, with the exception of Ireland, which had a very poor showing of camp figurines within the Viennese collection, but as we all know, has done incredibly well in the Eurovision. Underneath this frivolity, exploring the collections from this alternative viewpoint raises some difficult questions. It's been argued that museums reflect what is considered important in society, and the collection of ceramic figurines certainly includes representation of gender and racial difference. But for groups in society whose difference is less visible, including many people who identify as LGBTQ, seeing themselves reflected in the collections is more difficult and can rely on attributing characteristics, in this case campness, with an identity group, gay men. And since many gay men feel no associate no association with campness, this use of stereotypes can be incredibly problematic. Part of the residency involved doing work with outreach groups. During the interview for the residency, I was asked which groups I'd like to work with. And I was very clear that I'd be happy to work with any group the museum usually works with, as long as they were identifying as LGBTQ. I'm not sure this is what they expected, but I've got to say uh, they did a great job and the first group we ended up working with were rainbow families. Rainbow families are families where the parents identify as LGBTQ. Not all families look the same, and I was interested in bringing this group into the museum to see both how the museum reacted to the group and how the group reacted to the museum. We started off by working with clay uh, portraits where the families got to represent themselves in 3D. The group was also very keen to have portraits taken. And so we enlisted the help of Pat Pope, a photographer. I was conscious that museums haven't been brilliant at including LGBT people in their displays historically. So we decided to photograph the families within the British galleries these uh, set room pieces at, at the heart of what is Britishness within the VNA. Pat has a history of producing alternative photographs where the families are backlit, giving them a slightly uncanny air. And we were very knowingly decided to use this to address the absence that these families usually had within museum display and interpretation. The second group I worked with was called Opening Doors, and they were a group of older LGBT uh, people. We spent a lot of time talking about objects and the emotional connections people had with objects. As part of the work, we also were given a tour by uh, Zorian Clayton of the museum with an LGBT um, theme to it. The group loved the tour and loved working with the museum, but did mention that they felt there was a lack of LGBT inclusion within the labelling, that almost either knowledge or additional information was needed to find LGBT connections with the museum. 
I spent the next few weeks at lunchtime going around the museum to try and find all mentions of LGBT lives within the, within the museum. I could only find two, and the v &A is huge and vast. The two labels I found were one to do with Tom of Finland stamps, and the other one was Grand Fury's Kissing Doesn't Kill AIDS poster. So it could be argued that queer representation within the VNA was summarized as soft porn and sexually transmitted diseases. I find this sad. When I talk to people at the VNA, one or two, and by all means not everyone, said, but we don't talk about people being straight. Why would we talk about them being gay? And I think that I think that misses the point. Straight couples are, are everywhere. Here they're together in a sculpture. And the VNA is named after Victoria and Albert, a famous heterosexual marriage. But why is this important? Well, it's been argued that a mission from the museum does not simply mean marginalization, but it formally classifies certain lives, histories, and practices as insignificant. It renders them invisible, it marks them as unintelligible, and it casts them into the realm of the unreal. For me, nowhere was this more stark than in the Alexander McQueen exhibition that was on at the v &A just before my residency started. Within this huge exhibition, Alexander's uh, feelings of Scottishness were discussed. His dad being a London taxi driver was discussed, but his sexuality was completely silenced within the exhibition. And I think for a man who was very open about his sexuality and whose work has an inherent queerness, I think this speaks very loudly about what may and may not be acceptable within an institution. The v and has done a lot of work with, with uh, racial terminology, and within their document it says strategies of power and domination often extend to the naming and categorizing of people perceived to pose a threat to the dominant force. I think this is one way of looking at it. I think I'm also interested in strategies of power and domination, which extend to the erasure and silencing of groups of people. Within their equality and diversity at the VNA document from 2014 to 17, a 12-page strategy paper for how the VNA will continue to meet and exceed its duty under the Equalities Act. Um, Sexual orientation is included as one of the protected characteristics, as is gender reassignment. Within the 12 page document, there are 12 uses of the word black, five uses of the word Chinese, and five uses of the word India or Indian. There are zero references to lesbian, gay, bi, or trans. Kylie Minogue is mentioned more in the equality and diversity paper than LGBT people. In 2015, when I was there, this object, which I think is possibly 0, 0.0 of countless in the whole world, is uh, costumes from a ballet by Michael Clark that were designed by Lee Bowery and made by Mr. Pearl. Objects made by a queer maker designed by a queer designer and used in a queer ballet. This object didn't mention queerness anywhere in its labeling and interpretation when I started my residency. And I think that speaks very loudly about what is normal to be talked about within museum labels. Before I joined the VNA, while I was at the VNA and afterwards, there's been a huge number of people doing a huge amount of work. And I really celebrate all the great stuff that is happening there. Interpretation has changed massively in the five or so years since I was there. But I thought it was a, it's useful at times just to dig quite deeply into what the museum, what the organization is saying, rather than what it thinks it's saying. And certainly I think that held some 
difficult messages up to the VNA while I was there. In 2018, I was invited by the Fitzwilliam Museum to explore a collection of Parian ware, which is porcelain that has flux added to it to make it look like marble. I'm not going to talk about the main bit of the exhibition, but rather talk about how it spilled out into other parts of the museum. Through a series of pairings between existing museum objects and newly made ceramic pieces by myself, I want to set up questions and dialogues about the role of the museum and how the museum operates. Here, the newly created piece in the middle, C and C, is, is bordered by two historic Parian pieces and placed in front of uh, a painting of two sisters. It talks about the ability of people to see or look away, to know or not know, depending on the historical knowledge they bring to the museum. Elsewhere in the museum, two Parian pieces of Narcissus were placed in a case with uh, blown mirrored uh, orbs. Narcissus sees himself reflected in the orbs. And as we look at Narcissus and his reflection, we see ourselves reflected. It thereby, I hope, brings up questions of who gets to see themselves reflected and what lies are seen within the museum interpretation. In the porcelain gallery, it was already there. These white figures, to me, speak of campness and, and frivolity. I placed the two new black pieces there just to signpost that this work was already happening within the collections, whether we actively realized it or not. And within the Italian galleries, I placed this new piece of work called Other Kinds of Love. It's got a number of gender non-conforming individuals in there, as well as figures and objects from a number of different sources. It's paired with two Italian bronzes, one of Ganymede and the Eagle, and one of the leader and the swan. Ganymede and the Eagle involves Zeus as an eagle um, having sex with Ganymede, and leader and the swan involves leader being penetrated by a swan. This piece obliquely asks if bestiality with the swan and an eagle are okay within a museum context. Why has it taken museums so long to get comfy with including LGBT lives within their displays and their interpretations? The final project I'd like to leave you with is called Losing Venus, which took place at the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford from 2020 until just recently. The Pitt Rivers is a world cultures museum with uh, objects from around the world. When I was invited to work with them, I had in mind a talk that I had heard given by the amazing performance artist Bird La Bird, in which she compared a map of countries where it's currently illegal to be LGBTQ with a map of the British Empire. While these two maps are not identical, I think there's a strong correlation and overlap between the two. And I was interested in unpicking the links between them. The museum is full of objects and clothing that people used or wore, but it's relatively sparse when it comes to first person testimony. Most of what we know about the people who use these objects has been filtered through the lens of the curators that acquired and displayed the objects. One of the main sources of information about people is within the photographic collections at the museum. Within those collections, I came across the work of Henry Evans. These disturbing, systematic, and supposedly scientific recordings of difference, which mapped what was visible to the eye, but to current eyes removed the humanity of the subject. I was interested in exploring how this combination of scientific recording and erasure of emotion and humanity could be adopted and used as a visual method. From the 1860s onwards, the British Empire imposed legal codes 
which criminalized male to male sexual relations. These codes still impact today with over half, 38 of the 72 countries with anti-gay laws once being subject to British colonial rule. These laws have limited and continue to limit who people can love and whether people can be visible about who they are and how they identify. From the photographic collections, I selected images of people from seven different countries where the British had imposed homophobic legislation. Adopting the geometric backgrounds from Evans' photographs, the humanity was erased from the images until all that remained was what the people wore and what they owned or carried. In some ways, this can be seen as a mirroring of how museums can prioritize material culture over lives lived, loves loved, emotion and effect. Desire is persistent. Unintentionally, out of the tens of thousands of photographs I sifted through to find the ones to work with, four of the final selection of seven were taken by the same photographer. He was Wilfred Thessinger, and his writing about men contains references to queer desire, especially uh, during his travels to the Middle East. Within the museum, we often rely solely on written evidence to validate our knowledge. And with histories of homophobia, queer knowledge was seldom recorded or seldom preserved. We're therefore left with a repressed archive with absences, silences and loss. That I was repeatedly drawn to Thessinger's images with no prior knowledge of his biography, I would argue lends weight to Robert Mill's assertion that our encounters with that archives are saturated with desire. And sometimes we should believe that regardless of any documentation, when we know, we know. The Ethnographic Museum has traditionally been seen partly as a scholarly backwater, but recently has moved to the forefront of cultural disputes. It's all too easy to assume that queerness has no place in the Pitt Rivers Museum, and that by looking for queer relevance, this is a 21st century rereading of the collections. However, the effect of heteronormative Victorian collectors acquiring objects from countries subject to homophobic legislation ensured that queer narratives and biographies were highly unlikely ever to make it into the museum records. And in light of that, I think we need to recognize Europe's part in the systematic international epistemicide, which derased queer's ways of being, a legacy that museums have played their part in. Although this talk was called Notes on Queering, I think it could have easily been called How to Avoid Heteronormativity. Heteronormativity is defined as the institutions, structures of understanding and practical orientations that make heterosexuality not only coherent, that is organized as a sexuality, but also privileged. Museums are part of this structure of understanding Truly queering museums requires seismic change from collecting policies through to staff diversity and the makeup of trustee boards. But queer is also cheeky, it's fun, it's irreverent and it's playful. It should be embraced, wrestled with and enjoyed. Thank you.